the Judiciary Finance and Policy Committee. Today is March 26, 2014. Um, uh, Representative Slocum, we don't yet have a quorum, and so I'm going to ask you to start presenting your bill, and as soon as we get a quorum, we'll move it. Um, but welcome to the committee, Representative Slocum um, and testifier, and please go ahead whenever you're ready. Representative Slocum. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I would like to move House File 2928. It's going to the General Register, and we now officially have a quorum. So I would move that House File 2928 be re referred to the General Register. Representative Slocum. Thank you. Um, this is a technical bill. Um, to criminal vehicular homicide or operation statute. The purpose of this legislation is to separate the criminal vehicular homicide and criminal vehicular operation offenses into two separate statutes. This will enable the judicial branch to transmit necessary information more effectively, efficiently and effectively to the Vehicle Services Division of the Department of Public Safety. Currently, all this information... Representative Slocum, I'm going to stop you for just a second. Those in the back of the room, you need to take your conversations outside or quiet down. Representative Slocum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Currently, all this information cannot be transmitted electronically, and court staff must manually transmit some of the information to the DVS. Separation of the two offenses will provide more accurate information in public court calendars. Thus, judges, court staff, and the public will not mistake a criminal vehicular operation case for a more serious criminal, criminal vehicular homicide case. The DPS was consulted on this legislation. Um, I will now turn over uh, to answer your questions. Chief Judge Peter Cahill of Hennepin County District Court, 4th Judicial District. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Pete Cahill, I'm the Chief Judge in the 4th G District and also Chair of the E-Court Steering Committee, which is more relevant to this provision. And I simply would stand for questions if there are any. Questions from members? Seeing no questions, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Representative Johnson. Madam, Madam Chair, Representative Slocum, got a couple couple issues on, with this bill on uh, section or in uh, page 3 line 10 through 13 I have, I have as a former officer the question I have if I wrote somebody a warning violation for a something defective on their vehicle or a repair tag for their vehicle and I let them drive off they go two miles down the road and crash and it's because of that it, just because they gave a warning citation, is that officer going to be liable for anything that uh, could happen when uh, you're using the equipment violation as a possibility for a reason for reason for the defective for the injury? Representative Slocum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I'm going to refer to my testifier to answer that. Judge Cahill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that provision is in current law. This is simply reordering it. And the intent there, as I understand it, is if a driver has been told you have a problem with this car and you should fix it, that shows their knowledge and makes it raises it from mere negligence to maybe perhaps uh, gross negligence or recklessness. I can't uh, really opine on whether there is any liability for the officer. I can't imagine there would that since we have not changed the law and simply reordered it, I'm not aware of any suits that have arisen out of that subdivision. Representative Johnson. Thank you. Rep um, question? One, one other question on uh, 4.27 and 4.28 and along with uh, 5.19 through 5.20. 
if somebody's under the influence of marijuana or THC, with when it states other than these in the, are they going to be? On, is the county attorneys or going to be able to charge these people that are hot? High on marijuana for vehicular operation, criminal vehicular operation. Uh, Judge Cahill. And Chair Representative Johnson, uh, this speaks uh, again. It's the recodification that marijuana can stay in the system a fairly long time might not indicate it under the influence. However, I think there are a great many officers who are trained as drug recognition experts to be able to tell if they are under the influence of the drug. And I think it's because of the long-term nature that marijuana can sometimes stay in the system that years ago that exception was made for marijuana in the system to the zero tolerance for drugs in the system and driving. Representative Johnson. I understand the DREs are great people. The mm -hmm. problem is in rural Minnesota, they're hard to come by. They're in the metro area, up in I, my counties that I worked in is about 45 miles straight north of Minneapolis. And there's times we waited an hour and a half for a DRE. Um, and that that can get into an unreasonable de delay during the traffic stop. Um, so I think some should probably look at something to deal with this, other than just because it, with with just that in there, I think it's a concern for me that just because because of that it's in there might be a little more difficult to charge somebody out under it. Representative Cornish. Uh, Madam Chair, or, uh, Judge, are we just run into a problem this bill for this is being co-located or recodified where it's currently an existing language put in another place and it's underlined so it makes it look like new language in this bill? Repres Judge Cahill. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Cornish, yes. Okay. It is simply reordering. Okay. Uh, the need is to be able to pass convictions automatically and avoid human error in the manual transmission of the convictions. The language, the offenses, the penalties are, have not been changed. So the Madam, Madam, Cornish. Madam Chair, Judge Vin uh, Cahill? Yes, sorry. So there's nothing really in this bill that makes it any easier for criminals to get off or change the thing drastically, uh, that, like it makes it look at first glance like new language, it's existing language already. Judge Cahill. Madam Chair, Representative Cornish, I would agree with that statement. No. Other questions from members? Seeing none, the chair renews the motion that House File 2928 be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Slocum, I would move that House File 2574 be re-referred to the General Register. Representative Slocum. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File... Right 2574. 2574 uh, deals with predatory offenders. And what this bill uh, proposes to solve is that individuals who commit certain violent conduct are required by law to register as a predatory offender. The Bureau of Crim Criminal Apprehension maintains the central repository of, re of information about these predatory offenders and assists local law enforcement and probationary, probationary agencies with supervision of these individuals. This proposal requests several changes to assist with the supervision and treat predatory offenders in a consistent manner. Again, this is technical. The proposal also addresses a portion of the criminal code where the description of the crime also contains the penalty for two different crimes. I'd like to uh, introduce my testifier. My testifier is Katie Engler. And she's the senior legal analyst with the BCA. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Katie Engler with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and I will do the walkthrough of the bill for you. Section 1 makes several changes to registration requirements for predatory offenders. For example, the change in lines 1.22 and 1.23 would include all offenses in sections 609.322 and 609.324. Um, not just soliciting a minor to engage in prostitution or sexual conduct, but also including uh, promoting prostitution of a minor, receiving profits from the prostitution of a minor, sex trafficking, etc. The uh, change in line 1.24 would uh, 
have all conduct related to electronic communications with a child relating to or describing sexual conduct or distributing material that relates to or describes sexual conduct be now a registrable offense. Uh, the next changes are on page two. Right now in Minnesota, offenders who are convicted of a crime that arises out of the same set of circumstances are required to register. For example, if they are charged with criminal sexual conduct and burglary, and they plead to the burglary charge, they still are required to register. That language does not, however, exist for federal offenses and offenses committed in other states. And so the changes in uh, 2.5 through 2.9 and 2.11 through 2.14 would make those parallel changes. And the last change in section one is in line 2.27. Last year, you as a legislature recodified the chapter for people to be civilly committed as sexually dangerous or sexually psychopathic, and that is now chapter 253D. Most of the individuals currently under civil commitment uh, for those types of offenses were uh, committed under one of the two predecessor statutes, either ch Chapter 253B or Chapter 526. And so uh, line 2.27 is the first of several references back to those predecessor statutes. What we're attempting to do is uh, prevent litigation from those civilly committed claiming they're no longer required to register. Section 2 only contains one of those updated cross-references. Section 3 takes us to line 5.9. Um, first change is an update in how we capture fingerprints. They're no longer done with ink and rolled on a card, rather they're done electronically. You then have one of those predecessor cross-references, and now we're on to page six. Language is about photographing any offender. Right now, uh, only level three uh, offenders can be photographed. Level three um, is the most risky individual. <coughs> That risk assessment is done for people who have been incarcerated in a correctional facility, but they make up only 7% um, of the people currently registered. So we have the ability to photograph a very small subset of the totality of the uh, offenders. And so this language would allow photographs of any offender at any level and at any time. The next change is in 6.29. This again broadens authority for people who are doing the supervision to have contact with offenders. Um, and then we have um, updated or the cross-reference updates. Section 4 really begins at the top of uh, page 8. We have a, one of those predecessor references. And then in 8.13, there's a change in a verb to reflect the practice that in, we always extend the registration requirement for people who have been convicted for failure to register. Right now, the, the verb is a permissive one, and that it always happens. Um, in 8.16 and 8.17, we're changing language so that all offenders who reoffend get treated the same way. Um, right now, if someone is arrested and serves some time um, before they post bail, and then they are subsequently given credit for time served, the registration period is not extended. But if instead they serve that time after sentencing, the registration period is extended. And we're just trying to make that consistent across all offenders. Sections 5 and 6 are intertwined. Section 5 removes the language Representative Slocum referenced about the penalty being mixed in with the description of the offense. And section 6, which is page 11, places that penalty language back in the penalty section for criminal sexual conduct in the third degree. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Questions from members? <coughs> Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, I renew the motion. Uh, Representative McNamer. Madam Chair, Representative Slocum, um, does this address if you have a predatory offender that has to register in a state outside of Minnesota, then moves to Minnesota, he must register in Minnesota also? Ms. Engler? Madam Chair, Representative, no, I don't believe that is part of this bill. Okay. Seeing, seeing no further questions, 
Again, I will move House File 2574 be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Slocum, I need you to stay for just a minute. Uh, members, it's my understanding that the provision that we passed out of Representative Slocum's was not the first engrossment, and we needed to be working off the first engrossment. Everyone now has a copy of the first engrossment from that first bill, criminal vehicular homicide operation. So we need to make a motion to reconsider uh, the vote where we pass the last bill and then resend this bill um, as the first engrossment. So is there any objection to that? Oh. All right. Then I would uh, move to reconsider House File 2928 that was sent to the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Then again, I would uh, move House File 2928, the first engrossment, the language that you have in front of you now. Any questions from members? <laughs> Any concerns? All right. I would renew my motion that House File 2928 Madam be... Madam Chair. Yep. I, I'm sorry. I, would, I apologize for being a little late. Were there major differences between the first engrossment and this one, or the first, the original bill and this? Because seems like we're getting this and kind of making a judgment on the fly without having really read it. Uh, Representative Slocum, do you remember the changes that you made between the first committee and the second committee? Representative Slocum. Uh, and I'm chair. Actually, I will have Ms. Perius tell us if that's okay. Okay. Ms. Go Perius. Uh, Madam Chair and members, it added sections one through three, which were uh, cross-references in the DWI chapter. Um, so it added the updated cross-references to the changes made to the CVO section numbering. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. With that, I would renew my motion that House File 2928, the first engrossment, be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion prevails. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank Maybe you. I appreciate it. Representative Schoen, are you ready? Representative Schoen, I'll move that House File 2338 be re-referred to the General Register, and it's my understanding that the A4 amendment is your amendment, Representative Schoen. Madam Chair, correct. I will move the A4 amendment to get the bill in the shape that the author would like it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Schoen to the bill. Madam Chair and members, uh, House File 2328 is a domestic violence bill that disarms abusers who have been convicted in a court of law. This bill will protect victims and domestic violence uh, and stalking from gun violence and will reduce the number of women murdered with guns each year. First, I'd like to be clear about what this bill does not do because I believe there's been some uh, confusion. This bill does not allow the government to take guns without due process or conviction in a court of law. This bill does not allow for illegal searches and seizures as some have, have suggested. The bill strengthens protections for victims of violence by removing firearms from those subject to civil orders for protection and those prohibited from possessing firearms due to a criminal conviction related to domestic abuse. Under federal law, persons convicted of a domestic violence charge are prohibited from having guns. This bill allows the state to enforce federal law and requires persons convicted of domestic violence charges to surrender their guns. The bill in, uh, in conjunction with uh, amendments that have been uh, brought forward on this bill as it's traveled, uh, they, uh, the bill provides that those subject to an order for protection in domestic child abuse and domestic abuse be prohibited from possessing a firearm for the length of the order which mirrors federal law. In order for this section to apply, the bill establishes the following requirements which also mirror federal law. The order granting relief must be issued after a hearing in which the abusing party received actual notice and at which the abusing party had the opportunity to participate. The order must res one restrain the par abusing party from harassing, stalking, or threatening the abused party or restrain the uh, abusing party from engaging in other conduct that would place the abused party in reasonable fear of bodily injury, including finding that the abusing party represents a credible threat to physical safety of the abused party or prohibits the abused party from using attempting to use or threatening physical for against the abuse party. The bill adds to the list of ineligible persons under state 
uh, law as a person subject to an order for protection and persons who are disqualified under federal law. The bill provides that for those individu individuals convicted of domestic abuse, stalking, and assault in the first degree through fifth degree, or assault by strangulation against a family or household member, and the court must order surrender of the firearms under provision of this bill. The surrender provisions uh, under this bill and amendment are uh, that the prohibited party must surrender their firearms within three business days to a federally licensed firearm dealer, a law enforcement agency, or a third party who may lawfully receive them and does not reside with the abusing party. The bill provides differing standards for firearms tempor temporarily surrendered and those uh, permanently surrendered. The bill requires that an abusing party must file proof of transfer with the court and that is to a third party, such as a family member that's not living with them, a federal firearms license dealer, or even to the, uh, a law enforcement agency. I uh, want to thank both sides of this issue for negotiating in good faith. Uh, Representative Cornish and I have had many discussions in working with the uh, NRA and uh, other gun groups, the GOKRA, uh, in fact. Uh, you know, it, it gets us further down the road. Uh, we had more work to do. The amendment that came before you today sealed up some uh, continuing concerns that we had yesterday. And so the amendment that was put on today gives two extra business days for someone to submit proof that they transferred their guns. And then it allows the court to require immediate surrender to law enforcement of firearms if the abuser poses an imminent risk of substantial bodily harm to the victim. And this is something that's actually commonly done already. Uh, it allows the abuser to transfer guns that have been immediately surrendered to a third party or FFL upon written notice. And then upon transfer to a third party or FFL, the affidavit must be given to the court and must remain sealed. Questions from members? Uh, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Schoen, um, on the amendment, on the A4 amendment, uh, line 1.8 says imminent risk. Uh, can you tell us uh, where we find the definition of that and what it is? Representative Sean. Madam Chair, I, I would probably refer to, it's, it's in the domestic statutes uh, for starters, but, uh, but uh, staff would probably be the, uh, the best to give you the, what our legal def definition from the orders and related to that are. Mr. Diebel. M Madam Chair, members. Representative Draskowski, it's not defined in the bill, and I'm not aware of a definition in statute. It would be up to the court to determine that. And I'd have to do additional research if there's case law on defining that. This would be a new context, and so it would have to be uh, drawn whether that a definition in another case would apply in this case. I'd have to do some legal analysis of that. But this is a term given to the court to make use exercise the judgment. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I'd like to see what that definition is, and apparently we don't have it. I, I mean, that's an important term here in, in, in regard to how the court is going to make judgment in these cases. Representative Draskowski, why don't we let um, folks uh, talk about it? Oh, Representative Hamer, well, I'm not sure. if you could talk to your microphone. I'm not sure, Madam Chair, but I'm I just wondering if Mr. Diebel knows about the under the chapters that deal with self-defense if that language isn't used and defined while while we let staff look up look it up for a while why don't we take the testifiers that want to testify on the bill if that's okay representative Draskowski. thank you madam chair all right representative Schoen, do you have any testifiers yes ma'am welcome to the committee please come down if you plan to testify <coughs> welcome to the committee state your name for the record and go ahead Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Sarah Gruing, and I'm the St. Paul City Attorney. On behalf of myself and Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, who is unable to join us today, I am pleased to be with you this afternoon in support of House File 3238. My office handles roughly 1,000 misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor cases of domestic abuse every year, and the Ramsey County Attorney's Office handles more than 800 juvenile and gross misdemeanor cases in Ramsey County. Together, we are united in this community around a set of protocols called the St. Paul Blueprint for Safety. The blueprint establishes our system's response to domestic violence from that first 911 operator who takes the call all the way through to probation. 
The Blueprint for Safety is our interagency effort to prevent domestic homicide in the same way that legislat legislative efforts like these will ultimately save lives. In St. Paul, we have witnessed firsthand the havoc that domestic violence brings to our community, to our friends, and to our family members. We've also witnessed firsthand the toxic mixture of domestic violence and firearms. It is our experience that guns make domestic violence more terrifying. Firearms are an instrument of torture in relationships involving domestic abuse. All too often, our victims report that their perpetrator, that the guns perpetuated their abuser's cycle of power and control, that she was told time and time again that he would kill her or her children if she left, and the presence of a weapon in that home made that threat not just possible, but highly likely. We frequently see phrases in petitions for orders for protection in Ramsey County like, he has a gun and I am scared. Guns always also make domestic violence more deadly. As you know, a woman is six times more likely to be killed in a domestic violence incident if there are guns present in her home. The combination of domestic violence and guns affects the entire community. Nearly 60% of all mass shootings, including uh, the one that happened at a spa in Brookfield, Wisconsin two years ago where eight people were killed, involved the killing of a family member or current or former intimate partner of the shooter. Furthermore, if Chief Tom, Tom Smith were here, he would tell you that domestic calls are often considered the most dangerous calls that police officers take. A recent 15-year study showed that 14% of all officers killed in the line of duty were responding to a domestic. And 97% of those officers were killed with a gun. Domestic violence makes up the largest category of calls to which police respond. When the perpetrator is armed, not only is the victim at much greater risk of serious harm or death, but so is the responding police officer. And as you all know, we set a heartbreaking record in Minnesota last year with at least 38 people killed by domestic violence in 2013, 10 of whom were murdered by gunshots. 12 women were killed by a domestic abuser with a gun in 2011, and seven were killed by a domestic abuser with a gun in 2012. As such, I am pleased to support House File 3238 and the effort to limit the possession of weapons for those who abuse children, who harass or stalk their significant others, and who make them in fear for their lives. We know that it is not a panacea and that some people will still obtain weapons through illegal means. But House File 3238 is an important and crucial step that you all can take this afternoon to better protect victims, their families, and the entire community. Those who commit the crime of domestic violence have proven themselves to be a serious risk to their wives and girlfriends, to their children, and to society as a whole, and they should be prohibited from possessing guns. I have no doubt that this legislation will save the lives of Minnesotans, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to share my thoughts with you this afternoon. Thank you. Representative Schoen, your next testifier. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Carol Arthur. I'm the Executive Director of the Domestic Abuse Project in Minneapolis. DAP provides therapy programs for men who are abusive, for women and children who are victims of domestic violence. We have proactive advocacy support and assistance provided to all victims identified by the Minneapolis Police Arrest and Gone on Arrival Domestic Assault Reports. We serve more than 3,000 men, women, and children a year at DAP. I'm testifying in support of House File 3238. As you've heard, domestic violence is an issue that affects one in three women in this country. In 2012, over 63,000 Minnesotans sought services from domestic violence programs, yet we know only one in five victims will seek services. In 2013, as has been mentioned, we experienced 38 domestic violence homicides in our state and over the past three years, 90 Minnesotans have been killed in domestic violence murders, 50% of them with firearms. Minnesota has been a leader nationally and internationally at creating concrete solutions to domestic violence problems. In Hennepin and Ramsey counties and as other communities across our state, law enforcement is starting to do risk assessments at the scene of domestics to identify those cases that m are most at risk of escalating to increase violence, potentially to murder. Let me share three of the most common questions used in those risk or danger assessments. Oh. 
Has the physical violence increased in severity over the past year and or has a weapon or threat from a weapon ever been used? Is there a firearm in the house? Does he threaten to kill you and or do you believe he is capable of killing you? These questions have been tested in numerous reliability and validity studies as being able to help identify those victims at increased risk. In the most recent study, comparing risk factors among abused women and abused murder victims, the study found that women who were threatened or assaulted with a firearm were 20 times more likely than other women to be murdered. Women whose partners threatened them with murder were 15 times more likely than other women to be killed. And when a firearm was simply in the house, an abused woman was six times more likely to be killed. Clearly, there is a high correlation between firearms and domestic homicide. I'd like to share the story of Pamela Tusick, a 48-year-old juvenile probation officer who was murdered by her husband, Alan, in 2009 a woman this legislation might have helped. In th two months prior to her death, Pam did everything she could to protect herself from her abusive husband. Over their 23-year marriage, he had hit, punched, pushed, and held her captive many, many times and had threatened to kill her on at least four occasions. On August 26th, after he bloodied her nose and split her lip, Alan was arrested for domestic assault and false imprisonment. This was the most recent of 22 domestic assault police calls to her home. Two days later, he was released from jail without conditions because he had posted $5,000 bail. He told Pam he asked for bail so he would not have to have any conditions, particularly he wouldn't have to have a condition of no contact with her. Pam sought and was granted an order for protection on September 10th and filed for divorce on September 25th. On October 1st, after she returned to her home from a support group meeting at a battered women's shelter, Alan came to her door, and when she opened the door, he shot her, called 911, and shot himself. The current bill that would require the surrender of all firearms in cases where courts have issued an order for protection might have prevented this homicide. This bill is a small change that will have a significant impact on the safety of domestic violence victims and their families to ensure their basic right to be safe, including in their own home, I urge you to support House File 3238 and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Representative Sean, how many testifiers do you have? We want to make sure that we give equal time for anyone that might want to be think, opposed. Uh, Chief Snow is the last one. All right. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Schnell. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Maplewood and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association who uh, stand in support of uh, this uh, bill. Uh, and I will keep my comments very short. Um, as has been well documented by the previous testifiers, we know that there is a clear, clear uh, evidence and data that suggests that anytime weapons are present uh, with batters and abusers, there is a much higher level of risk of domestic homicide as well as uh, risk to officers responding to those incidents. Uh, we believe in our, our review of uh, this bill as uh, presented that uh, it does and will provide for the protection of um, women and children in our communities, uh, and we stand in support of it. Uh, we believe that, um, that the provisions laid out in the bill uh, do allow us to provide uh, for the safety of, of weapons and a range of options for those people making both temporary and permanent transfers. Um, and believe that uh, ultimately this will create safer communities. Um, I thank you uh, on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association for your consideration of this bill, um, and we urge you to support uh, House File 3238. Thank you. Representative Schoen, anything else? All right. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? If you want to testify, please come to the table, state your name for the record, and go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members, thank you very much. My name is Andrew Rothman. I am the president of Gun Owners Civil Rights Alliance. I want to thank Representative Schoen for his diligence in removing the infringing elements contained in this bill when it was sent from Bloomberg headquarters in New York. We know that domestic abuse is a serious issue in Minnesota and around the country, and the two million law-abiding gun owners in Minnesota 
hold these cowards, these abusers, in, in utter contempt. Nonetheless, we do maintain that this bill is largely duplicative, redundant, and superfluous given the restrictions already contained in the federal law in the Wellstone Amendment, as a matter of fact, championed by Minnesota's own Senator Paul Wellstone. In the heartbreaking story of Alan and Pam that you just heard about, the law did not fail this victim of domestic abuse. Minnesota statute 629.715, as every good prosecutor knows, already empowers judges to impose conditions of release, including the immediate removal of firearms from the home. It is absolutely tragic that after decades of abuse that this didn't take place. But if a judge chooses not to impose that condition of release, the judge could equally impose not to impose this, uh, this order for protection in such a way that it would trigger this removal of firearms. But more broadly, I'm concerned with this fixation on hardware. As you heard from previous testifiers, 10 of the 38 murders uh, related to domestic abuse last year involved firearms, 26%. The other 74% didn't. Now, if you look at the Department of Public Safety's numbers for homicides throughout the state, we find that 71% of homicides in the state involve firearms. So a domestic murder is actually a, only a third as likely as any other kind of murder to involve a firearm at all. Firearms aren't instruments of torture. Uh, causing someone's immediate death is, uh, is, is, is not torture. And an abuser's uh, MO, the, an abuser's intent is to cause fear, to cause pain, and to cause suffering, not to end it. Um, the, the notion that the guns perpetuate the cycle of violence doesn't make any sense. And I, I've been asked by several people in relation to the ship to this bill, when the uh, order involves the removal of firearms from the home, which might make some difference in, in these 10 homicides, um, are they going to remove the baseball bats and the knives and the fists and boots from the abusers as well. We have a real problem with somebody who poses that sort of danger who is actually let loose on our streets. I think rather than spending time worrying about the hardware, worrying about the firearms, I think this committee and this body's time could be better spent in looking what needs to be done to change the hearts and the minds, or at least to lock up safely away from civilized people, these abusers in the first place. Anyone else in the audience wishing to testify for or against this bill? Madam Chair, members, uh, Jim Franklin with the Sheriff's Association. I want to thank uh, Representative Schoen for the work that's been done in this and all the people that have uh, collaborated. Uh, yesterday we had questions about it. Many of those questions have been addressed. I'd like to have this bill move forward. There are a couple of things that we want to have a little bit more clarity on, but I'm sure we're going to be able to work those out. The general concept of what's here, we certainly support, endorse, and want to try to move forward. So with that, I'll just move forward. Thank you. Okay, it's my understanding that staff uh, can give us a report potentially on the question that was asked by Representative Roskowski. Mr. Deal. Madam Chair, members, as my, I said in my original response, it's not defined in statute. It's used elsewhere in statute. For example, in 245C.17, it directs the Commissioner of uh, Human Services when they're doing background studies to determine if someone is an imminent risk to those that they interact with in their professional capacity, and then they put restrictions on them. But it doesn't define imminent risk. It's left to the Commissioner to determine. So it would require to determine how the courts interpret imminent risk would require a, a case law research to determine what elements they look for. It is a similar term is used in Chapter 518B, which is the domestic abuse statute, where it refers to imminent physical harm, bodily injury, or assault. And so I suspect that it's probably been interpreted through case law, but it's not defined in statute. Thank you. Representative Skowski, follow-up. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Diebel. Uh, you know, I, I would rather have the legislature developing a definition for imminent risk than a judge um, as we look at this particular bill. I, I, I see another uh, term here on 2.23 of the bill, credible threat, and I'm curious as to whether or not that term has a definition in statute as well. Um, so I, it, it appears to me that this bill still needs more work, Madam Chair. And uh, I don't know if we need Mr. Diebel to answer that question too or not, but it's, it's in the same vein. Um, uh, you know, it might make sense to lay this bill over and, and come back and take a look at it next week. Any other questions from members? Representative Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Schoen, uh, I myself have served many of these harassment restraining orders uh, and the ex parte orders and the temporary orders. But you have a term in here that I've never seen before on these orders. You actually have two terms. Uh, I think would make this more, actually more clear as to who's responsible for what on these orders. Uh, in your bill, if you have abusing party 13 times and abused party four times just in one paragraph. On the orders, it's either the respondent or the petitioner. And I think it'd be more clear and more understandable and line up better with the orders if you change those words to match the words on the order. Representative Sean? No, I don't, like Madam Chair and Representative Johnson, I don't find fault with your logic there. I think that that's something that we could do even before we get to the floor. I think those are pro that those would be appropriate terms to, to put into place. I believe there's one last testifier who wanted to speak. Please come to the table, state your name for the record, and go ahead. My name is Chad Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, in my review of this bill, uh, I've come across a, a few 800-pound gorillas in the room that nobody seems to want to address. And some of it's policy procedure type things that maybe somebody uh, not familiar with the system may not understand. First of all and foremost, when you're in the system, and first of all I'd like to say domestic violence is a terrible thing. It shouldn't be tolerated. Uh, abusers should be um, handled appropriately and so forth and uh, that's a terrible thing but I, I don't hear anything or anybody uh, talking about the times where you're falsely accused but I'll get to that in a second. If there's a domestic violence situation chances are there's going to be charges filed, criminal charges, domestic assault, domestic something assault under those uh, uh, provisions. And if there's an order for protection or restraining order, the, the order that it comes up is your restraining order or protective order will come up first before your case can get properly adjudicated in the courts. Which means, in my experience, when you go to your restraining order hearing or your protective order hearing, your hands are absolutely tied because of your criminal pending case. So you are likely to go neutral and accept the, um, accept the no contact order just to prepare yourself in the best possible position for your criminal case. So here you are potentially as an accused individual being passive on a no contact order and then a provision in this bill automatically provides you and, and labels you prohibited from owning firearms. Um, that's absurd. Your due process at that point is not taken care of. And at that point when you go to court at your first appearance in this domestic violence order or restraining order, at that particular moment in time, the court has the opportunity to check that box. No firearms. There's a box that they can, that they can check or choose not to check if it's not appropriate. If this bill passes as it stands, someone would have to be passive on an unadjudicated <coughs> case and then their firearms rights are potentially gone on a case that's not even adjudicated that could possibly go away 
in the, in the criminal proceedings that were to come. So potentially your case could be completely adjudicated in the criminal side and now you, you're a prohibited person because you had to be passive on the original no contact order before your criminal case is decided. That's fundamentally a, a problem with this bill as it is. Briefly, I had the opportunity to take care of my mother for four years in my house as a caregiver, someone who had Alzheimer's and um, dementia issues. It's not easy to say no to your mother. Those of you that have taken care of family members, I'm sure you can agree. To make long story short, one day my mother uh, called police and um, 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 accused me of abuse. It was terribly heartbreaking. The first appearance or contact with the court realized that there was dementia and Alzheimer's issues in my house. The original judge said, go home and take care of your mother. Looked at the file, looked at the abuse allegations, and said, go home and take care of your mother. But what happens is, when there's an abuse claim, adult protective services gets involved, and now you're in a big, huge mess of bureaucracy that unless if you've ever experienced it, you can not possibly imagine what you're up against. Adult Protective Services, for a week, worked on my mother to try to get her to sign and to buy into a no contact order and a restraining order, and my mother said no. She even went so far as to recant her story. But, about, but Adult Protective Services wouldn't have any part of that. My mother called me to take, me, take her home from the hospital and I picked her up and to take her home. When I got home, there's a police presence at my house that would rival anything that you'd see on TV. So obviously, the police at my house did not get the memo from the original judge that said, go home and take care of your mother. I cooperated with authorities. Um, later on, when things settled down, my, my mother came home, we called the police, told them we were fine. They came to my house. What Adult Protective Services did then shocked me. They went to a different judge in a different court, declared my mother a vulnerable adult, forced her into a restraining order or a non-protective contact order that she did not want, and then ordered, ordered the no contact order, took her out of my house, the no contact order is in place that she didn't want, and now she's under protective custody, and I haven't seen her since November. When the restraining order came up for court, it came up before the charges that came up for adjudication. And exactly what I just mentioned happened to me. I had to be, I had to be passive in my no contact order situation because my criminal case was pending. Fast forward to the criminal case, the charges were dismissed. The domestic violence, the domestic assault were dismissed. But now I've got this no contact order from my own mother for two years because Adult Protective Services got involved and forced a restraining order and a no protective order on my mother that my mother did not want. I have a few solutions and uh, a few things and, uh, and I, I know time is, time is uh, important. It was mentioned that if this bill passes, that you will have three business days to dispose of your firearms. I guarantee you that if you get that letter, that you have three days to dispose of your firearms, on the fourth day, law enforcement will be at your door with a court-ordered search warrant to search your house for weapons that you may or may not have. And if there's no database, and you're in a situation where there may or may not be weapons, but you're now a prohibited person, you're going to have and, and I believe that could be an unintended consequence to this bill. You've got about a minute and a half okay. left. Okay, thank you, Chair, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to see stronger penalties for people that make false claims. There are plenty of valid claims of abuse and domestic violence but an order of protection or a restraining order can also be used as a weapon in of itself. Two people getting divorced, a relationship is, is ending. One files a restraining order against the other, and now they move on with their life. They get on living separate places, but because an, a judge 
orders a no contact order, that person that's moved on with their life is prohibited from owning or possessing weapons, that's absurd. An order of protection on his face is not a crime. It's an allegation of, mm -hmm. of, um, of fear or whatever. The other thing I'd like to see is I'd like to see a prohibition of forced restraining orders when it's clear the restraining order person that's labeled, say, a vulnerable adult to stop forced restraining orders on someone who doesn't want it. And I think the only difference sometimes between the difference between uh, the petitioner, as you mentioned, sir, and the respondent is who shows up to the court first. People are getting divorced, they make allegations. Who's going to file the restraining order of the protective order first? The one that shows up first is in the driver's seat. The other one is, is really far behind. The other thing I'd like to say in closing is I think it might prevent uh, false claims is if a person is going to file a false claim in a restraining order or protective order situation, have both parties subject to that restraining order both give up their firearms. If both people fire, give up their firearms in a restraining order or protective order situation, then it can be less likely to be used as a weapon against the other. Mm -hmm. So if you consider some of the provisions that I brought forth, if this bill would be passed, like I said, I do believe domestic violence is a, is a very bad thing. It should not be condoned. But we need to provide for provisions for people that are falsely, falsely accused as well. Thank you. Questions from members? Representative Blash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and, and sir, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't, where did you go? I have a question of the gentleman. And I didn't, I didn't get your name. <coughs> Sir, my name is Chad Nelson. Mr. Nelson, thank you. Um, how is it that you were led to believe that you were forced to be passive in the hearing on the OFP? Mr. Nelson. Um, I was advised and in counsel with, with the court when Adult Protective Service was involved and the order up for protection comes up first, that if you try to fight the no contact order at that moment in time, mm -hmm. your Fifth Amendment rights come into play on self-incrimination. If you were to say something that uh, you shouldn't say, something that's, may, uh, if you misrepresent a fact or get a fact wrong, and then you go to court and it goes to trial or something, something can be taken out of context. When you're actually you're fighting the, mm -hmm. the no contact order in, in of itself, you really put yourself in jeopardy by making statements or making factual accountings of something that could come back and not be totally accurate or not as accurate as you would like when it comes to the criminal side of the case. Does that answer your question? Okay. And Madam Chair, I think it does. And I'm, I'm desperately searching for something in the recesses of my brain that believes that there was a provision in um, uh, Minnesota Rules of Criminal Procedure that obviates that, um, but I don't recall. Um, so if there's any in the audience who can confirm that, um, whereby um, you, you would not be cross-examined on those, um, I'd appreciate it. A little phone a friend. But I have one other uh, question, uh, Madam Chair. Of who? Representative Lash. Uh, Mr. Nelson. You say that you went to pick up your mother at the hospital. Uh, was your mother in the, in the hospital as the result of the incident in which the police were originally called? I'm glad you asked Mr. That, Nelson. Sir. Absolutely not. When the judge ordered that I go home and take care of my mother, my mother was already released from the hospital with, a, with an examination from head to toe, CAT scans and x-rays and everything. There's a, there's a mark. There's a remark in the record that says there, it is, her, the condition of her body was unremarkable in the lack of marks on her body, which indicated absolutely no evidence of abuse whatsoever. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, and I, and I appreciate that clarification, Mr. Nelson. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Sir, can I, I, can I clarify something on that? Because I think... Mr. Mr. Nelson, Representative Lesh was still talking, so Representative Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and um, there was a helpful uh, friend who was able to pull up subdivision 15 of 518B, whereby 
uh, in that OFP hearing, um, they can't use any of that testimony that you make, um, Mr. Nelson, against you in a subsequent uh, domestic assault proceeding or prosecution. So um, I think you were, you were misled uh, on that. But I think that's the importance um, of this provision. There's a reason it's in here like that and also why um, absolutely if you're, if you're innocent, um, you should challenge an OFP at the time. And I, I guess I think that that provides enough safety for any individual uh, who is accused of this and, and whose rights in contesting an OFP should not be chilled because of the fears that, that you mentioned. And, and I think you are absolutely right about that. But I think the law does provide adequate remedy for that. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Scott had a question. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I know that in, I think it's in this committee, we're going to hear about people that were falsely accused being exonerated. And I, I know those occasions are rare, but, uh, and that's for, you know, larger offenses, felonies and, and that sort of thing that sends people off to prison. But, you know, I just, I just don't think this, this bill is quite ready. I, I think there are some real issues that need to be resolved here, especially with um, the false accusations. Um, you know, as most of you know, I've worked pretty hard on the shared parenting issue, and it's one of the biggest hurdles we have. And um, is, is the false accusations can be ma uh, made, an OFP can be issued, and um, it restricts um, even contact with children that, and, you know, I'm going on and on here, but what it really does in the long run when false allegations are made and these OFPs are filed is it's, it's really, um, it gives true domestic violence a bad eye because it, does, it, it delegitimizes true domestic violence. And I, so I have a real problem with this bill not addressing that particular issue where, where innocent people could have their Second Amendment rights um, mm -hmm. taken away from them because of something that someone said. Represent, Representative Cornish, did you want to speak? Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Schoen, I think there's problems with the bill too, but I want it to progress. I, uh, you've been amenable to changes so far, and I'm sure you'll keep working on it on the House floor. But, uh, sir, I don't think there's anything that we can do to take care of all the problems. Uh, um, the false accused, it's always going to happen. There's no way we can get into the mines and stop that from happening. And while I'm not shouting accolades about the bill either, um, I appreciate Representative Schoen and what he's done so far with it. But there's no way to stop false accusations in the future no matter what we do. Somebody could always get mad, injure themselves, and make a false accusation and send it to court. And, and I think uh, there's no perfect system here, but we're doing as good as we can on this thing right now. So. Thank you. Any other members? Uh, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, uh, Madam Chair, don't like to disagree with my colleagues and those in my own party, but uh, Representative Cornish, uh, well, or, or Representative Lesh, of course. Um, but, um, uh, you know, false accusations is an area we need to deal with, and Representative Scott's absolutely right. And, and Mr. Nelson, uh, you, you hit a spot that uh, is, is, is right on target, and um, that's not probably within the, the context of this bill here today, but certainly it's something this legislature needs to grapple with, and we need to have some, some consequences for people who uh, file false allegations of domestic violence, uh, uh, and it's really brought to light and evident in this, this bill and your testimony today, so I appreciate that. Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, like uh, the, the concerns that uh, Representatives Johnson and Scott and, and I brought up, uh, uh, I would hope, uh, Representative Schoen, that you'll work with us on some of these concerns we brought up as it moves forward, and um, I, I struggle with the bill too, uh, because I don't think we need this bill. Uh, I know uh, the votes are here today to pass it, uh, but um, and, and like Representative Cornish said, I understand that you've been uh, very amenable to working with the opposition on, on fixing some of those things, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Seeing no further discussion, the Chair renews her motion that House File 3238 
as amended be re referred to the general register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Sean. Representative Lesh, we're going to pass on you for a minute because you're on the committee, and we're going to um, go to Representative Allen if she's still in the room. Representative Allen? <laughs> Members, we're going to try to keep going as long as we can to try to get through this agenda. So, um, Representative Allen. The chair will move House File 3027 be re-referred to the General Register. <laughs> Representative Allen, keep in mind that this is the Judiciary Committee. We don't want to hear about the whole bill. We only want to hear about the narrow provisions that apply to this committee. So Representative Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill uh, makes technical changes to the uh, North, Star Care, North Star Care for Children program that is administered by the Children and Family Services uh, within the uh, Department of Health services, uh, Department of Human Services, and I have a testifier here from the department who can go through the technical changes. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, keep your comments really to the sections that are within the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Madam Chair, members, my name is John Sellen. I'm an area manager at Hennepin County and uh, serving at the Department of Human Services as project lead for North Star Care for Children. Um, we're currently looking at House File 3027. There's a uh, more extensive uh, bill subsequent um, that covers more provisions. I'll try to keep them separate. We're not hearing that other provision, that other bill. We're only hearing this one, I think. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can clarify. Representative Allen. You have a bill brief where it has three uh, section articles, and the bill before you is Article 1 in its entirety. So. Thank you, Representative Allen. Mr. Um, Sellen. Madam Chair, members, um, I think the area that would probably be of most interest to this committee is the background study section, which is Section 5. In Section 5, it adds the federally required background study requirements. North Star Care for Children makes extensive use of Title IV e and e equalizing benefits for foster care, for relative care, and adoption assistance. And again, that's Section 5 of Article 1. Representative Allen, is this the same as Representative Huntley's bill that's here? Uh, Madam Chair, no, it's, it is not. Okay. It's separate. Okay, please continue, Mr. Sullen. Um, Madam Chair, uh, if I might clarify your question, Representative Huntley's bill also includes provisions, including some overlapping provisions, um, dealing with North Star Care for Children, but it's much more extensive. Um, because there were fiscal impacts, those are included in Representative Huntley's bill, 3215. So once the background study is done, if, if we could just cut to the portion that's determined by the court, um, this is really about <laughs> placement of children and what the court determines or uses when they're determining who they can be placed with. So we heard in civil law that there was some concern in another bill uh, when it's uh, the background study and um, exclusion of family members who want to be taking in these children. So is that in this bill? Mr. Sullen. Madam Chair, no, that is not in this bill. Okay, so is there anything that impacts in this bill what, when a court makes the determination of where a child is going? Is that Madam, what's in this bill? Madam Chair, to the best of my knowledge, there is nothing in this bill that would affect how a court would proceed. Okay. All right, so please continue. Uh, Madam Chair, I think that's the main section that might be of interest to this to this committee. If you can identify other sections, I'd be delighted to talk about them. So it's my understanding that in Section 12, there's really the custody to relatives is what I'm looking at the um, the article uh, or the uh, bill brief uh, in Article 12. It says custody to relatives. It amends 60C.515 subdivision 4 lists the requirements for a transfer of permanent legal and physical custody to a relative, the factors that a court is to consider. Madam Chair, are you referring to Section 12? Uh, that's what it says, Section 12. Oh, this one. A two amendment. Yeah. 
that night. We could have just a second. We're looking at the bill brief provided by House Research. I just want to make sure that we're looking at the right one. Madam Chair, I think it's possible that I can clarify this. If you look at the bill summary, um, the header identifies this as a version as amended by um, the A2 amendment, which was not put on. It was not put on. Okay. All right. So that's not, in, that's, that's not a change that you're going to make in this bill. Madam Chair, that's correct. All right. Any questions from members then? Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm unclear on why this is here. If it's if we're not going to deal with that section, if well, first of all, I don't see that delineated in the bill that we have in front of us. And so and I'm not sure or you're not sure that this other section that the testifiers pointed out even applies um, to our committee. Should this be re referred or are we the section 12 that you alluded to that was an amendment, it, are we missing that? Um, was, it, was it added in another committee? That was not, okay. Representative Scott, it's my understanding after consultation that it was not added in the previous committee. Um, I'm just looking here to make sure. Section seven has tribal court. All right. And it says also um, line 6.20 talks about tribal social service agencies prior to the issuance of a court order transferring the child's guardianship. Okay. So are there any questions from members about those provisions? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Just so we see if there's any controversy surrounding it. All right, are there in, any questions from members? All right. Anything else that you'd like to add, Representative Allen? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, uh, that she asked a question about the amendment. And that, that was, I just want to clarify, that was withdrawn. All right. <clears throat> Seeing no further questions, the chair will renew the motion that House File 3027 be re referred to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Huntley, because we're on the topic, are you in the room? Let's keep going in the same general subject matter. Members, um, it was an oversight that this bill was not listed on the agenda. It was listed on the website. We had talked to other folks, but um, it just was inadvertently left off the agenda that was posted in the back. So, Representative Huntley. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, House file 3216 is the governor's uh, health and human services finance bill. I think the uh, part that, is, that this committee is interested in is article three, starting on page 23. And that relates to a, uh, what's called a North Star Care Program for Children. And uh, we have an amendment that would, uh, I think, get rid of most of the problems. And hopefully it will get rid of most of the problems and then be able to quickly move this bill on its way. So Representative Huntley, tell us about the amendment. Uh, the amendment, uh, there, there are two things to think about in, in this section of the bill. One is uh, the judge making decisions about uh, where this uh, children, who's going to adopt this kid. And uh, one of the other things the amendment does makes clear that that is not changed. The judge still makes the decision as to who's going to adopt this kid. Uh, but there's another part in there, and that's basically federal money uh, that goes for adoption assistance. And they have different rules. Uh, and uh, what this um, amendment does is make clear that it's the judge's decision and uh, uh, about where the kid's going. But it, uh, we have to obey the federal law on moving the money with, with the kid. And we have people here to answer that. Great. So basically, um, members, we heard this in um, civil law, and there was some questions about 
um, whether or not this changed the standard for um, qualification of whether or not a child could be placed with a family um, be based on the licensing by DHS. And then this is making it clear that the court, it's, it's really about the money. So whether or not you're eligible to get the money, the court can still determine that the family is eligible. Is that correct, Representative? We, yes, and we heard a case where uh, a grandmother wanted to adopt her kid, but the grandmother had had a check forgery conviction. So, so the background check would have eliminated her from being uh, uh, the adopted one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Representative Huntley, um, do your testifiers want to answer questions or they want to testify to the subject matter? Ms. Hugdall, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Melinda Hugdall from Legal Aid. Um, there are two pieces of this, as Representative Huntley indicated, and I'll quickly kind of walk through the amendment that you're looking at, the A2. Um, the kinship agreement is going to deal with essentially if they're doing a transfer of legal custody to a relative. They're going to be doing that with relative or kinship assistance or without it. So we kind of are setting up a separate track for doing that with the amendment. But it doesn't prohibit the court from doing the placement. It's just having the relative after the records today have a point to make some choices about how that might work. Um, I think the operative piece for the committee, which was the substantive change to the statute about transfer of legal custody and the court's authority, is really uh, line seven of the amendment, which is, oh, I'm sorry. Where's that piece, John? Mm -hmm. uh, on page 42, lines 18 and 19, deleting the new language. That was where the substantive change in the transfer of legal custody statute was. We took that language out. There is some other new language that deals with the kinship placement agreements, which is really get into whether the relative is going to receive kinship assistance or not as part of the transfer of legal custody. But it's a, it's a separate, the judge will have an agreement regardless whether they receive assistance or not. It's just that it doesn't impact the ability to do the placement. So members, the reason this bill was here is because it was modifying the court's ability um, to make these determinations and it was sending it to the DHS background study. Um, I believe that with this change, it keeps it back in the court system. Um, any questions from members? Madam Chair. Representative Portman. Um, has the bill been moved? Um, it has not yet been moved. It's going to your committee, right? Correct, Representative right. Huntley? So, yes, House File 3215. I would move that the bill, uh, House File 3215 be re-referred, and I, I would offer the A2 amendment. Representative Hortman moves the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, Representative Hortman renews her motion that House File 3215 be, rec uh, be re referred to the Health, Health and Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Hortman. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members. Next we have Representative, John, Representative Johnson. Is there anyone on your um, testifiers that has to go right away? Or Okay. All right. So Representative Seltzer, are you still here? Representative Seltzer, do you have the A4 amendment to get the bill in the shape you would like it? Representative Seltzer. Yes, I do, Madam Chair. All right. The chair would move House File 2481, that, and it's to go to the General Register, and I would move the A4 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevail. Representative Seltzer, to your bill. Thank you. Uh, Chair Hillstrom, and I will keep this um, brief because I know time is of the essence. This bill is the Department of Public Safety initiative as statute directs the Department of Public Safety as having the primary responsibility for school transportation safety. The two primary reasons that this bill was drafted was in response to significant safety concerns regarding our children on school buses. One is due to children being left unattended and forgotten on school buses, often in extreme temperatures. 
and number two is um, known incidences where school buses have been inspected and placed out of service uh, for unsafe equipment, yet the school buses were put back into service and used for pupil transportation without any repair or corrective action taken, jeopardizing the safety of children. And so uh, this does deal with, this uh, bill I just want to mention also does deal with type three vehicles, which are the vehicles that, um, and there should be a picture in your um, handouts. These are the vehicles that generally transport our special education and our Head Start children, and they usually have 10 or fewer uh, drivers. So I will um, just draw your attentions to um, the portions of this bill that would be of interest to this committee. Um, one is a criminal, if you look in section four, a criminal offense to require or allow um, operation of an out of school uh, bus is now a gross uh, misdemeanor. Currently, this is not a violation. If you look uh, in section seven, this also requires a type three driver to report a loss of driving privileges to their employer to ensure they're not operating a type three vehicle without a valid license. So this would be a misdemeanor and this language mirrors the statutory language requirements of larger school bus drivers. And then finally, what might be of interest um, to the committee is uh, in uh, section nine, it does identify the administrative uh, sanction, the action of a one year disqualification to the school bus endorsement of the driver if the court determines the driver failed to complete an interior post-trip inspection of the bus to ensure no student or students are left unattended and the result is, is that there is a child that has been left on the, on a, in the school bus. So that's just a very quick summary of the um, areas that um, would be of interest to this committee. And I also have with me um, Major Nancy Silke and uh, uh, Lieutenant Brian Rue from the Department of, of uh, Public Safety. So are you planning to testify or just answer questions? Madam Chair, Nancy Silke with the State Patrol were just available for questions. All right, questions from members. Uh, Representative Droskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Representative Seltzer, uh, if I remember right, a type three school bus and we now have licensing requirements um, for volunteers, parents, and others around a type three school bus, uh, which can include vans and cars and other types of normal vehicles that we all drive. Is that what we're talking about here? We're not talking about the yellow buses, are we? Representative Seltzer. There are some type three are smaller yellow buses. However, this, my understanding is, and I will defer to um, Major Silky or Lieutenant Rue, but this refers to, not volunteers, but to actual employees driving these. So there's, there are type three, uh, type three buses, there, there is a picture in, there, in your handout which shows you, it's like a smaller school bus. I don't Madam think, Chair. I don't think we have that, Madam Chair. Ooh. State your name for the record and go ahead. Lieutenant Bryan with the State Patrol. Madam Chair, uh, Representative other members, the Type 3 is the non-yellow school bus or the non-yellow vehicle, so your minivans or passenger cars that the school district or company might use to transport smaller number of children. Um, so it's the passenger vehicles is what the Type 3 is. Representative Lesh, did you have a question? No, Representative Moline. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Seltzer, who exactly is subject to the prosecution of the gross misdemeanor that's being added in line 1.23? Who would like to answer that question? Go ahead. Madam Chair, um, Representative Malin and members of the committee, that ultimately would come down to whoever made the determination to put that vehicle back into service without the repairs being done. So if it's at a random location inspection at an event, we put the bus out of service and the driver makes that determination that we're taking this vehicle to get the kids home and our investigation would show that it was a driver, then we would charge the driver, be, you know, file it to the court, submit our um, reports for potential charging and, and go for the driver. 
if it's an annual inspection and the maintenance supervisor, whoever it is at the terminal or facility determines we don't have the parts to fix it, we're going to use it anyway, that really all comes through our investigation and reporting procedures. Representative Moline. Madam Chair, I guess just a, that seems unusual to me that an employee of a company could be subject to a criminal prosecution because their employer has a vehicle that's not up to code or is in violation and then to, to then prosecute an employee. From my understanding, that's what could happen under this situation, that an employee of a company could actually be prosecuted. Lieutenant Rue. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative and members, that's correct. If that employee was the one that intentionally took that vehicle that they knew was out of service and put it back into use without having knowing the repairs were done. Representative Dreskowski. Madam Chair, I'm wondering if, uh, Representative Seltzer, if you could review Section 6 with us again. Um, so this van or this car that everybody has one at home or knows of somebody that has, a, has one, um, we are apparently the schools require um, or statute requires, I, I don't know, um, that they... Uh, that they inspect inside to make sure there's there's nothing dangerous in the car or van or something like that and then we're going to apply a misdemeanor if they fail to do that inspection. Can you tell us more about that again? The post Representative Seltzer. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The post-trip inspection, if I understand your question correctly, Representative, uh, the post-trip inspection is just looking inside to make sure all the children are out, that we don't have any children left on the bus. There have been several instances where children have been left on the bus in the cold. Representative Dreskowski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Representative Seltzer, how, how, um, how do we know uh, whether they look to, uh, I mean, I, I, it seems to me most people who uh, who, who look after kids in a school and, and, and when they're driving a car or a van to an event and back or whatever they're using it for are probably going to look in the car and van and make sure the kids are out. Um, again, these are, these are cars or vans and we're going to apply a misdemeanor uh, for uh, somebody to potentially allege that somebody did something wrong. So I'm curious more about how is this proven that they didn't look uh, to the back of the car or van, which is about a quarter turn of your head, as I understand, in those vehicles. Representative Salser. Uh, may I defer to, um, to Major Silke? She would like to respond. Uh, Madam Silke. Chair, Representative, the uh, provision that you're looking at in um, Section 6, there is a amendment that uh, goes with that on line 1.16 of the A4 amendment. Um, that amendment adds the language of any known violation and I would just also add that the language is stricken in regards to it being a misdemeanor. Uh, the friendly amendment that we do have here on the A4 uh, lines 1.16 and 1.17 articulate that section 1. Point, or excuse me 169.89 does not apply to a violation of this subdivision and basically what that statute refers to is any violations under Chapter 169, if they're not so identified, become a petty misdemeanor. So in this particular case, this is not a petty misdemeanor. It's not a misdemeanor. It basically creates a, a mandatory reporting situation where we request that if there is a known violation where a child was left on the bus, that the, the uh, language then asks that that known violation be reported to the Director of Pupil Transportation as typically we only learn of the information from a parent or the media. Thank Representative Drozkowski. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you. Um, uh, so it, it sounds to me like the, um, the criminal penalty is gone and there's not even a, a petty misdemeanor there existing now with the amendment as I understand it. Is that correct? Madam Chair, uh, Representative, that's correct. All right. Other questions from members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, <clears throat> my name is Tom Keller. I'm here representing the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association, and I'll be as quick and as brief as possible given uh, the constraints of the committee. So I'll sort of cut to the chase. Um, uh, last year, um, the school bus operators came before this committee um, to raise the fine for um, crossing arm violations, and this committee chose not to do that. Um, this year, the committee is being asked to create a one-year suspension of an S endorsement for school bus drivers for a violation of leaving a child un unattended on a bus. Um, that's primarily the language on page six of the, the bill itself. Um, we've been working with the State Patrol, which is um, most, um, but not all, of our um, concerns are addressed in the A4 amendment. But the, the huge sticking point is this one-year um, uh, 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 suspension of the license. Now, um, the School Bus Operators Association has suggested a, a higher fine, very large fine, um, with funds going to the school bus safety account, which would um, put it in Lieutenant Rue's uh, Office of Pupil Transportation Safety. Um, we're having enough trouble hiring drivers today in a lot of parts of rural Minnesota. Um, it's expensive to train, recruitment is very difficult, um, and we now have to tell them that you get a gross misdemeanor for leaving a child unattended on a bus. Um, and even though there is this time frame of the um, uh, 50 feet um, visible uh, sight of the bus and 10 minutes after you've gotten off the bus. And that was at our request because we sort of were thinking about, well, I mean, at what quick parameter time frame are you off the bus and you still haven't checked? You know, and the larger concern, too, is, is that um, there's no due process in regards to this penalty um, of the gross misdemeanor. Um, if you look in the amendment, the A4 amendment, um, on line 1.13, uh, the court shall ensure that section 63.40 subdivision A is complied with. I didn't know what that was, I had to look it up. Um, and what this is, is the kind of the language on um, uh, certified copy of disqualifying offense conviction sent to public safety in all school districts, it's similar to that. But there's no due process to that. But the subdivision right above it has some due process language, um, which we would really love to have in effect. Um, and then I suppose this is the last thing I'd say. Um, yesterday um, I spoke with uh, the Hennepin County Sheriff and asked him about what about parents leaving their children unattended in a, in a car? Um, what's the penalty, the fine for that? And he said more than likely a tongue lashing, a stern lecture from the law enforcement officer. If it's a really egregious violation, heat, cold, um, length of time, you know, and he really didn't say what length of time would be, that uh, it would probably be reported also to child services. Um, but there's no automatic penalty, there's no automatic fine, those sorts of things. Um, so I, I think you know, we're asking the committee to sort of look at this one-year suspension. We think it's really a long time um, and will further make it difficult for us to find drivers to drive our buses. Um, but certainly we understand the severity and the tragic nature of leaving children unattended on a bus. Representative Droskowski, then Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Mr. Kelleher, maybe Representative Seltzer or others, uh, Section 2 of the bill again, uh, and Mr. Kelleher was talking about it, a gross misdemeanor if a child is left unattended uh, on a school bus. Now, is this the Type 3 school bus, the, the car or the van, or is this a yellow one? Madam Chair, it's my understanding that these are the, um, all the yellow buses, that I think you have a picture before you of the types of buses. Well, there's seven categories of different types of buses, and they're basically most of the yellow ones that say school bus on the top. Um, so it's those types of vehicles. Representative Draskowski, a follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, staff advice that the gross misdemeanor is gone in the bill. It's a petty no. Thank you, Madam Chair. You. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Keller, do most of these bus companies, do they have policies or rules within themselves that um, says you need to check the bus before you leave it for the for the day, for the uh, night. Madam Chair, um, Representative Scott, absolutely. Um, we take this very, very seriously. Um, no school bus company wants to be in the local newspaper having this occur. We have training sessions with our drivers. A lot of our bus companies have voluntarily installed a safe student button in the back of the bus. Causes the driver to actually walk to the back of the bus and push that button before they get off. Um, some have suggested um, that we mandate that into statute. I know I have a couple members who probably don't think that's a great idea, but that was suggested. We're not really into retrofitting $100,000 buses. Um, but uh, in the, in, in I know one particular bus company, they have a sign um, that the driver must place in the door that says, empty, I have checked. 
Um, I mean, it's a very serious thing, and we take it very seriously, and um, we're doing everything that we can to make it not very not happen at all. Um, you know, and as I said in the other committees, um, we transport millions of miles of students um, over the year, um, and there are a couple of these a year that happen, um, and they are newspaper worthy, and there's been some articles in the Star Tribune in regards to this sort of thing. Um, and uh, we just think that the, the, the penalty for one year is excessive. Thank you. Further questions from members? Uh, Representative Moline. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. And maybe if council could clarify for me, if staff could clarify, for the bottom of page one of the bill, lines 1.22 and 1.23, where it says a violation of subdivision six is a gross misdemeanor, is that still part of the bill or was that removed in the amendment? I just can't figure it out. Who, I'm sorry. Um, what's the question directed? Staff. Staff. Okay. Uh, Ms. Perius. Uh, Madam Chair, members, um, I believe that portion is still in there and the violation of subdivision six that it refers to is on the next page at the top in section four. Representative Moline. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that's what I was referencing in my earlier line of questioning, that there still is a gross misdemeanor in the bill for the employee or driver of the bus if they're the person that operates a bus that is supposed to not be operated, supposedly. So it sounds like the gross misdemeanor was taken out for the portion dealing with the inspection, but not for the portion of whether or not an out-of-service vehicle is being used, just for clarity. Thank you. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe uh, the State Patrol or Mr. Keller could answer this, but uh, what does out of service mean? Um, if the windshield wiper isn't working and it's a sunny day, is it still out of service? Uh, Lieutenant Rue. Madam Chair, Representative and other members, we have an inspection criteria and essentially the critical components such as brakes, tires, um, the, the safety features of the bus that are designed, um, steering, suspension, if any of those items have a defect, that would place that bus or vehicle out of service. So there's other minor violations, like you mentioned, a windshield wiper, um, clearance light, those do not place the bus out of service and that would not be an issue. It's just clearly if there's a safety defect, a critical inspection item, um, that would put that vehicle out of service. So, so, Representative Gruskowski. So these are, uh, again, we, we don't have the pictures, so uh, we, we like pictures, though. Um, <laughs> but um, this, so this is the yellow school bus. We're still in the yellow school bus here. Okay. Please, Madam Chair. Mr. Or Lieutenant Rue. Madam Chair and Representative, essentially the, the Type 3s get inspected as well, so the same thing. If they had a brake issue and we put it out of service and they used it. So this is all school buses based on inspection. Madam, Madam Chair, last question. Uh, so to the State Patrol, um, uh, where did, did, did the government bring this bill or, who, or did Representative Seltzer bring this bill or where did it come from? Mr. Keller. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, Representative Jaskowski, um, in the fall, um, it was under our understanding this was a housekeeping bill. And I think you can tell that since I've testified in every committee objecting to at least the section I'm talking about today that I think it's a little beyond what a housekeeping bill is. Um, and I'd also like to just add very quickly that, you know, the driver would end up making two penalties. We'd get the gross misdemeanor and lose the S endorsement for a year um, for the same violation. Representative Paymar, did your committee need to hear this bill? Well, Ms. Madam Chair, there is a, there still is the gross misdemeanor in here, and, and I, I'm just not sure if Representative Seltzer alerted uh, the committee about the bill or not. It's, everything's been happening so fast, so she may have. And, um, there is no uh, fiscal note of zero, so I, it's sort of a toss-up, but I guess not necessarily. Are there questions? Remember, Representative Dreskowski. Madam Chair, I don't know if I, my question is fully answered. So did the government bring this bill? Um, sorry, Major Silkey. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, um, this is a Department of Public Safety initiative. Uh, the Department of Public Safety is tasked with being the, the lead on the people transportation uh, and anything related to the school bus transportation. And Lieutenant Brian Rue is the director of the people transportation and one of his duties is to proactively address any concerns. And um, if I could just respond to maybe I think some misinformation and confusion related to the amendment. 
Um, currently, it is not a gross misdemeanor for failing to, currently there is no requirement for anyone, any bus driver to do a post-trip inspection. There's a pre-trip inspection required. However, we're trying to address these children that have been left on the buses in these extreme weather conditions where they've um, been locked in the bus, crawled out the window, uh, walked out into traffic, tried getting into cars thinking it was their parents' vehicle. So we're trying to address the safety concern of not having a post-trip inspection by requiring that in the bill. I would share that it's not a gross misdemeanor as Mr. Kelleher um, alluded to, it's actually a petty misdemeanor. So there wouldn't be the crime associated with that. Um, there is the administrative sanction that we do propose related to the school bus endorsement only being disqualified. It would still allow the driver to drive coach bus, maintain their commercial vehicle driver's license, and perform in, in other duties um, uh, related to that. And if I could just maybe address the due process uh, discussion as well. The due process is only, uh, is addressed because the administrative sanction only takes place upon conviction of the court. Um, and, and then that information then being reported to the Department of Public Safety. And in response to the, um, you know, request for the uh, increased fine, and I'll do respect, and we've made many concessions to the bill and we have really worked aggressively to try to make it amenable to the parties involved. And um, in a previous committee, there was a request for a reduction of the fine. We did accommodate that. We did make the petty misdemeanor. And so now, in all due respect for Mr. Callagher to ask for the increased fine, um, is somewhat um, different than maybe what the previous discussions were. Uh, and we uh, obliged and conceded to the petty misdemeanor in the past. So I would just share that the, um, currently it is not the gross misdemeanor, it's the petty misdemeanor. And and um, the disqualification is an administrative sanction if, in fact, they're found guilty of not only the, not the, performing the inspection, but an actual child is left on the bus. Representative Skelsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I, you know, I, I just wonder about different parts of this bill. It seems the, the department is being rather aggressive. I think we're, we're, we're seeing the, um, the, the, the merging point or the um, separation point, if, depending on how you look at it, between, um, you know, kind of stuff happens and, and common sense versus are these actual intentional criminal behavior uh, that we're looking at here. I, I, uh, I, these bus drivers that I know anyway, and I'm sure Mr. Kelleher would echo my comments, uh, they care about their kids more than anybody else. Um, on their bus and, and uh, they go out of their way and, and do work to do the right thing and sometimes in life stuff happens. I just wonder if we're writing a law and writing criminal behavior here uh, in, in, in regard to section four and then uh, the other language that you said and, and it is taken out in the amendment. I understand that on the other section. If we're, if we're writing bills and writing law to try to create uh, penalties or consequences uh, for things that, you know, stuff happens when we got 5.4 million people in Minnesota. So that's all I had, Madam Chair. Final question, Representative Scott, and then well, we're going to vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is to Mr. Kelleher. What happens to a bus driver now if, if he accidentally leaves a kid on the bus? Are there some consequences within the company? Mr. Kelleher. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Scott, um, a lot of the bus companies have an individual corporate policy depending on uh, what the um, supervisor or owner of the company believes is an appropriate penalty. In some cases, the driver is let go, but not always. Um, you know, it's a difference between, you know, it's five minutes, two minutes versus some longer period of time. And, I'm obviously trying not to get into that sort of discussion about how long it's appropriate or inappropriate to have a child unattended on a bus. Um, and I should just clarify real quickly, it's, um, it was my understanding that it was a gross misdemeanor for leaving a child unattended on the bus and the license. If it's a petty misdemeanor and you lose your S endorsement for a year, then I just read this wrong. I apologize. I, I guess the point I was just trying to make that. is that it seems like sometimes this, like Representative Reskowski said, stuff happens. but. Companies already kind of self-police this sort of thing, so I, I don't know that the bill's necessary. All right. Seeing no further discussion, the chair renews her motion that House File 2481, as amended, be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative.